whether they were students in my class or in a number of cases uh, they were externs that I supervised on numerous occasions or I got to work with in other capacity. So it's super fun for me to have them all back to speak with you. Uh, and in planning this panel, we also try to pick a variety of career paths for the alumni so that you get to see how many different paths there are um, coming out of UCLA School of Law. And all of these people have amazing jobs right now, one year out. And so with further ado, you do not need to listen to me. Uh, what I'm going to do is let each person introduce themselves, give a little background, talk about uh, their job, how they got to their job uh, from UCLA School of Law, and then I'm going to start to ask some other questions about it. So, Carl, if you will lead us on. Yeah, sure. So, um, so for the next uh, 24 hours, uh, I am an associate at Global Road uh, Entertainment. Uh, tomorrow, I get laid off. So, um, right off the bat, I just wanted to get real. Um, so I started out um, in 96 with my undergrad degree and then I spent a year as a writer's assistant um, on a TV show and then 15 years after that as a corporate and securities uh, paralegal with my own business. I wasn't with a firm, I did contract work with attorneys. And then after 15 years of that, um, uh, I went here for law school um, and um, uh, nothing through OCI. Um, in fact, throughout my entire three years uh, of law school, I had zero callbacks, like none. I had one interview that got me my 2L job, which was an in, uh, internship at NBC Universal, um, but no callback. They were just like, we've seen enough. We really don't want to see you again. If we just give you the job, will you just not come back for another interview? And, um, and then so that, that turned out to be a really great strategy. So, but after law school, <laughs> um, uh, that's when I got a couple different offers. One was like with a small entertainment law firm in Century City, and one with, uh, was with uh, I Am Global, which merged with Open Road to become Global Road. And so uh, I got the Global Road gig uh, from uh, a friend of mine who I met here. She was an LLM during my 2L year. She started working there first and then brought me uh, on board. And after a year, this uh, company through um, various uh, fraudulent and mismanaged uh, practices uh, uh, went bankrupt, is going bankrupt, at least half of it is, and, uh, and so a lot of us are, are being laid off. So um, the, the transition that I've noticed and the guidance that I want to provide is going to focus on you know, how, that, um, how the, the first job out of law school goes and then what happens in the independent film world when you lose your job because you know, what happens next uh, is dependent upon how you performed over the previous year. Um, so, so that's that's a, that's the kind of thing that I can speak to. Alexander. All right. I'm Alexander Morris. I'm currently an associate director of legal and business affairs at Warner Chapel Music. Um, I went to Cal Poly Slow for undergrad. Came here for law school. Um, and I had a lot of externships during law school. I worked at um, Escape Artists, a production company. I went, I worked at Warner Chapel, um, Rosen Law Group, a small entertainment firm, and CBS. And then I went back to Rosen Law Group, um, Riel Spring, and I worked as a law clerk. And then they brought me back after the bar as an associate. So that was my first job. I was doing film, TV, and music, transactional work. And then um, in February, I made the switch over to Warner Chapel. Um, I had just followed up with them every couple months, went out to lunches, and they kind of told me that whenever a spot opened up, it would be mine because I kept in touch with them. And then in February, they told me someone was leaving, and if I wanted the spot, it was mine. So now I do. Um, drafting of publishing agreements for songwriters, and um, I love it. It's a good switch. Hi, I'm Jill. Um, I'm a business affairs coordinator at a small production company called H Collective. It's fairly new. Uh, I, during law school, I had uh, an internship with True TV over the summer after 2L, and then all throughout the year. I externed with Blumhouse Productions, and um, 
that experience is basically what helped me to get this job. I actually I got it by applying on uh, to a post that was on entertainmentcareers.net. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've been there since last October, so almost a year. Sam? Hi, I'm Sam Lehman. I'm associate at Lakeman Watkins in the Century City office, primarily working with the entertainment, sports, and media group. Um, my story is not quite as long as Tal's, but it started a little bit earlier than most people in this room. I took six years off in between undergrad and law school in that time, found my way to LA. And my now wife was and is working in the music industry, and I found myself surrounded by all these artists, and for the first time sort of saw a law school path that made sense to me in entertainment. So I went to UCLA with the idea in mind of doing entertainment law. And um, when I got here, I found that it was a lot harder than I expected to get an entertainment law job. I was also really looking at music, which Alex has done a very nice job of getting a job that, that is not easy to get. I will put out there, you kind of have to be willing to do what you did, which is awesome. Um, the, when, I, when I went through the OCI process, I remember saying to some firms, uh, who were names, that I was really interested in their entertainment practices, and they were like, we don't hire into the entertainment practice, and I was like, cool. This is going to be a good 19 minutes and as we sit here in silence, you know, because you're not for me. But ultimately, I did uh, join a group that does transactional entertainment work. It actually, incidentally, is the same group that Sue worked at when she started her legal career, which is kind of funny. And, um, and now I am very happily there. I do a mixture between <coughs> sports, media, film stuff, some general corporate stuff, a lot of pro bono stuff especially during your first year during the lean moments, which is totally fine by me, happy to do the pro bono work. Um, but generally speaking, it's on a more corporate scale, so our clients tend to be film studios as opposed to talent. We have a couple talent projects that we work on. I'll probably tell a story about one or two at some point, but for the most part, large scale corporate. All right, uh, I'm Brandon. I am an associate at Greenberg Lusker, which is a mid-sized, single office, entertainment-centric, full service firm with a lot of adjectives. Uh, we are actually one of those firms that do not hire entertainment associates straight out, and I was told that as well. Uh, despite that, I decided I'm gonna roll the dice and just kind of work in like their, corp their general corporate department and then just kind of get that on my resume, and the plan was just get an entertainment firm on my resume for a few years, some transactional experience, jump in-house somewhere. That didn't work, that, even that didn't go quite according to plan, because uh, when I started, I only informed that there was just literally no work in corporate or not enough work in corporate to justify putting an associate there. So I went on litigation, which I never wanted to do. So it was a very frightening first couple months. I realized we do so much entertainment with entertainment litigation that I would still be fine following that same general plan. I just have to kind of suck it up for a few years. Uh, but I started getting in my own head that if I couldn't quite get a job within the first few years, which like you see the layoffs at Sony right now, is certainly possible, I kind of be pigeon-held as a litigator. So with that paranoia, I decided to kind of weasel my way into the entertainment transactional department, and I mean that in the most literal way possible. Uh, I just started volunteering for litigation assignments, with the partners that did both litigation and transactional. Uh, worked extremely hard, like build one tenth of my hours to make sure everything was perfect. Kept asking for transactional work, and I mean kept asking like three times a day for four weeks. Eventually they just threw a few little small things at me. Did the same kind of practice where spend 100 hours a week but build 10, you know, so it looks like I'm super fast and efficient, but really not. And eventually I just kind of got a tryout and kind of a lot of luck that was kind of fell on my side and they needed it some essentially labor for a month. So they kind of let me just do some production legal work. And before you know it, I was indispensable and I moved into the normal entertainment transactional apartment. I've been there for two or three months now. Brad, did you have your job through OCI? Did you start a with them or was it a... Did you get the position with them after your, in third year? Yeah, sorry, I didn't mention that. So, yeah, it was through OCI. Um, yeah, that's basically it. I had other offers that might have had a better shot at <coughs> landing an entertainment transactional 
department, but I really liked everyone in my firm. And like I said, I figured I'd be out in two years anyway. But I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen now. I'm not planning on it now. So. Great. So as you can see, a lot of different pathways as well as a lot of different employers, and yet everyone who's up here today is doing entertainment work uh, of different kinds. So there are a lot of pathways. Um, first question I'd like to start off with today is think back to your time in law school. And I'd love uh, each of you to give me thoughts on what courses you took that you thought were really useful. Uh, yes, please say entertainment law. <laughs> Uh, but apart from entertainment law, what courses did you think were uh, you've seen so far quite valuable, even if it's basic contract law? Um, and what courses, now that you've got a year under your belt, do you say, gosh, kind of wish I had taken that one, but I didn't? And there may be not. But um, maybe we'll go in reverse order. Brandon, do you want to hit that one first? Sure. So I did a lot of the entertainment-based classes, and I think they're all incredibly useful, but you'd be surprised how often they come up. I should mention, I didn't mention, my firm does, uh, represents just about everyone in the entertainment industry, talent, uh, production companies, maybe not major studios, except in like, litigation maybe, but production companies, talent, everyone on the music side, both sides of the music department. Um, so literally every class here was useful in some way, whether it was the guilds class, uh, motion picture financing, which was incredibly useful because the guy who wrote the book that they use in that class or used in that class joined the firm after I accepted my offer, so I didn't even know he was going to be there. I just showed up the first day and he looked like the back of that book. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I blew him away because I knew, like, I read his book. And I made sure not to mention that, so it looked like I was thinking of it on the spot. <laughs> Great advice, by the way. Actually, Sue Aiken's class, she did a great job teaching you like the practical stuff, the practical side of entertainment law. So if you're in a position like where that comes up, use what you've learned from her class, but pretend you're thinking about thinking of it on the spot. You impress everyone. It does make sense now, but it will. There's a lot of deception in your story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I avoid easily in the most literal sense. <laughs> Do not deserve to be right. Yeah, yeah, I'm the reason I'm right. Uh, I also took a very wide array of entertainment classes here since I sort of knew that was my goal going in. Um, in addition to entertainment law, which might as well be mandatory if you want to work in the industry, frankly, especially because it's a broad survey class that it is guaranteed to touch on whatever corner you work in in, in a meaningful way. Uh, we uh, kind of, you know, one brand I mentioned, but the Hollywood Guilds class has been super useful for me because nobody really understands the guilds unless you spend an entire semester learning about the guilds. And some, at some point in that class, you're like, man, I'm spending a lot of time on three guilds. <laughs> uh, but with three guilds plus one that thinks it's a guild, but you'll get that if you take the class. Um, it, that was really, really useful. Music industry law, super helpful. If you want to work in music at all, you absolutely have to take that. Uh, Sports in the law, Professor Darian Clinic was my favorite class in law school. I absolutely love that class. Um, and it was nice because it's a clinic and it allows you to actually do, this is not what happens, transactional work in the entertainment space. It's crazy, I know. And now you've got a couple extras now, but when we were here, it was the only one that did anything like that. I took it out. It was awesome. Um, cannot plug that class enough. I, I, uh, IP, obviously. I even took international and comparative sports law, which sounds niche, except I was able to. Oh, you to, just missed your plug. He like, just said no, to the absolute. No, another one is coming. Favorite. Another one is coming. <laughs> yeah, but just know that he's coming back here for me. I didn't really mean to interrupt that. <laughs> international and comparative sports law is this class that seems very esoteric, right? Yeah. Except today and many days in the last six months of my life. I have been working on this long-term project for um, for Facebook. They're doing streaming rights for soccer in, in various parts of the world. One was just announced recently. They're doing La Liga, which is the Spanish league in India and Pakistan and Afghanistan. We got to work on that, representing Facebook. It's awesome. There are others that I... Oh, the other one I can say is that uh, Champions League, if you find yourself in any of Latin America, 
outside of Brazil in the next six months and you feel like you want to watch a Champions League game, just pull it up on your phone at any time. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> but so for that, for that kind of stuff that I'm working on, they'll have these arbitration clauses that say, you know, it'll be disputed in CAS. Which is like nobody knows what CAS is. Unless you take, you know, the International Comparative Sports Law, in which case you know it's the court of arbitration for sport. It's tucked away in Switzerland, and it's where everybody goes to have all of these disputes about, you know, anything related to international sport. So anyway, the point is, all of these classes show up in my work on a daily basis, all the time. They're incredibly useful. Um, yeah, I mean, I think they've already said this, but all of the entertainment classes you can take, anything that gives you, like, exposure to terms, even, like, at that basic level, really helps you when you're, when you start working and there's, like, abbreviations, and because you've heard the terms so many times, and so many things have repeated them so many times, you're like, oh, I can, like, figure out what this means. Um, I think the most important thing for me in law school was um, my externship with Blumhouse my last year. If you have the opportunity to do an externship um, in-house if you want to do entertainment, I really recommend that. Um, I Classes that I wish I had taken, maybe I didn't do any of the like clinics, and I did the negotiations clinic or the, the confessional law. That, I mean, that would have been awesome. Um, again, I took pretty much all of the entertainment courses that we had here. I think for me in music, the most important was copyright. Um, music, I think, is very much more complicated than film and TV, just because you're working with two copyrights. Um, so I think that was the most helpful. I also took the IP survey, so I kind of got a double dose of copyright. And then I also took uh, music industry law with Susan Janko, and that was very helpful for just getting a feel for the whole industry. Um, and then, of course, entertainment law was helpful to get an idea of everything because my first job was not just music. It was film, TV, and music. So having um, an introduction to like all areas of entertainment is really important, especially if you're not sure which one you want to do. Um, well, unlike Sam, I really like particular <laughs> um, So one of, one of the things um, that comes up a lot that I notice um, in entertainment law is that they really hammer uh, on drafting and negotiation as two skills um, that every employer asks for and, and presses you into service regarding. So I had come into law school sort of blase about those topics, drafting, like, all right, I've seen contracts, I know how to, you know, put together a contract, you just steal from other people's previous contracts, and you put a few finishing touches on it, and a uh, negotiation, I'm like, well, you want this, and I want this, and, you know, uh, I weigh more than you, so I win, <laughs> whatever. I didn't really put a lot of, like, thought into how important those, um, those concepts were, those skill sets were, um, and so uh, the bit of practice that I did get through sports in the law clinic uh, and, and other classes uh, really helped, and I wish I took uh, more of that. The other plug I wanted to do was the NBC Universal internship I did with the rights group there. Um, I, I feel that like uh, sussing out like the, the, the rights involved, not just the copyright, but um, all the different thousands and thousands of little pieces that, that rights can be um, uh, distributed in, um, you can take a copyright and you can uh, shatter it into a thousand little pieces and somebody gets the distribution rights to Kenyan pay TV and somebody else gets, you know, the uh, broadcast rights, you know, in, uh, in Germany or whatever. So you can have a ton of different rights and being able to actually sit down and go through not just the electronic files that NBC Universal has, but boxes and boxes of physical files dating back decades um, to put together a, a chain of title. Um, really come really came in handy uh, when, uh, uh, when it came time to do you know my job. Great. So uh, a couple of you mentioned a great internship or, uh, or a good externship. Was there anything else for any of you that you felt useful while you were here that you glad you did? Whether it was dealing with a certain organization, whether it was connections you made. Uh, you know, you mentioned an LLM when you were a 2L. Um, you know, any other steps that you took? Well, maybe it was having a job outside of the law school or taking a course at Anderson or TFT. Are there any other elements that you thought 
that you did here that weren't kind of in the straight academic line. And I'll just turn that out to anyone because I know a couple of you have mentioned externships or internships. But were there any other activities here that you did that you thought uh, was useful? Maybe it was working for a professor or, or that you think was useful either in getting your current career path or in your current practice area. I mean, getting the first gig out of law school um, would not have happened um, if, if I hadn't had uh, made friends. I mean, both both offers that I got, one for the small entertainment firm and, and one with I'm Global that I, I did take, were made because of people that I knew. Uh, one, of, one of which very well and one of which not really well at all, but just because, you know, they knew who I was. It was somebody who graduated a year earlier and I think was on this panel last year, Connor. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I didn't really know him that well, but a, a mutual close friend who went to school with us uh, said, hey, yeah, you should talk to Connor about his position or whatever. And he was like, yeah, we're, we don't have anything, but kept me in mind. And when something came up, it was like, oh, yeah, it just made things a lot easier. So I'm, you know, I, I'm reminded of uh, Professor Winkler in, in uh, 1L Conlaw uh, class saying, guys, you know, look around you. You know, you're, you, you want to network with, with, you know, people who are judges and governors and senators, but the people in this class are going to be the future governors, senators, and so on. And, uh, and really it's, you know, you hanging out with people in your own class that's going to help you the most. And I took that to heart, you know, like, since then, you know, during the last five minutes of, uh, of the, you know, exams, when you guys are all, like, typing away and everybody in our class was just like, you know, the final exams, just like, I was going up and down the aisles, like, hot towel. <laughs> just being, just being of service. And, um, but no, and, and, and the thing, especially too, to remember um, that I always have to remind myself of is because since I hate networking so much, um, I uh, it's important to me to you know just hang out with people because I like people and I like to like just like be, you know, chill out, and I don't like the high stress of like, oh, I'm going to ask you for a job now. And that never worked for me, and I, you know, and I hate those types of forced, you know, contrived situations, but I love hanging out with people, and just by doing that, it's like, that's good enough. That's all, that's all that it's about. So I, I would say definitely just hanging out with people, and like, hanging out with as many different groups of people, not just with your cliques that you're comfortable with, but like different groups and things like that. Um, I would highly recommend that. Yeah, to piggyback off of what Tal said, people is the most important answer for me by far. I mean, I did an externship as well, and that was incredible, and then I got lots of very good guidance throughout that, by the, you know, throughout that externship process, both by where I was at and in-house at UCLA. Um, Professor Edgar was my advisor, and she was very helpful, including getting me out of what would have been a dodgy situation early on when the law firm I was going to work at sued the place I was working at. Uh, that was tricky. <laughs> yeah, you remember that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but, but, but I, when I got here, I was, again, you know, I had taken six years off, so this may skew a little bit more towards those who were a little older, but uh, I found the most useful things. I just found everybody who's, when I was a 1L, I found the 2Ls and 3Ls and picked their brains about how to do it. When I was a 2L and 3L, I looked for the young alumni, Every single music attorney, entertainment attorney I could get my hands on, I went out to dinner, coffee, drinks, whatever with, just, and I, with no expectations, sort of like Todd was saying, just like, got any advice for me? Lay the land, anything you can tell me as I go through this process, I'd really like to know, it's a little tricky. And that was incredibly valuable to me. And as a result, I feel like it's my job now to do the same thing for people too, which is, I imagine, part of the reason why the five of us are here, is we want to be able to be there to answer questions for you guys as well. I was still going to be alcohol, actually. There's not too much. <laughs> By the way, I love Del's like, I was just myself, man. Yeah, tell me you're really funny. <laughs> and I took a lot of finals with you. I don't remember any hot towels, but, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, like really, take advantage of the resources that are here. I mean, one of the beauties of going to a place like UCLA and not a place where they actually become all the governors and presidents and whatnot, like at Yale or whatever, is that people are a lot more laid back here. And they're a lot more willing to give you your their time and energy because it's really nice outside and you can just chill out in the courtyard, right? Like, it, it, it really, like, it, this is a different place than some of the other places. So I really strongly recommend you take advantage of the lawyer. Kind of, like, really piggybacking off of their points. It's a triple piggyback. Yeah. <laughs> really high up right now. Uh, I, <laughs> somewhat really. I got you guys. <laughs> uh, somewhat related advice is just, like, 
meet and hang out with people in the industry, not necessarily through UCLA, not necessarily even lawyers, but just and not not asking for jobs, not like an obvious like schmoozy networking thing, just like hang out and just like get to know them, ask them about their day. I mean that's kind of cliche, but ask them about their, their practice or their job. You find you learn a lot even if it's not related to law at all. Like I learned a ton of stuff from like a sales manager at Lionsgate. It doesn't do anything that I do really, but like you learn enough that like it comes up later and it's super helpful. Uh, and then just because you're not like pestering them for jobs, you're just like actually hanging out and being genuine with them, they you wind up getting more referrals that way. I've gotten a few referrals just from people that I like like people at Lionsgate or people at Sony that I had hung out with. Apparently their wives or husbands worked at CAA and they referred a client into our doors and they asked for me and I had no idea what was going on. Like they someone like, like called my office or showed up. I have no idea who you are, but that looks like an open conference room, and you know, it's just the little things like that. And not, and like I keep harping on, you really do learn a lot, even if it's not from a lawyer. So, and not ever, you might not have. My, my wife worked at Lionsgate, and now works at Sony. So, not everyone's gonna have the opportunity to just like show up and like bug people and just like sit next to them and you know help them with their fantasy football lineups. But to the extent you have that opportunity. <coughs> It's also just nice to be reassured by alumni. I was never and still not very good at networking. It, like I just feel very awkward when I feel like it's someone that I should make a good impression on. Um, and I remember at the end of three L year, I the they sent on a list of alumni with like different sections, like the different sectors that they work at. And I went through and I found someone who worked at Fox, uh, Mark Oganassian, I think is his name. And uh, I like set up a call with him. And I was fully expecting to like have another conversation where, no offense, he was like, yeah, I got a job at OCI, and then worked at a law firm, and that's how I got my job now. Uh, and he said that he was actually just like me. He didn't have a job when he graduated, and after he took the bar, he just applied, and he found a job as a business affairs assistant, and then was able from that to like, work his way up. And he said the whole reason that he signed up to do that, to be an alumni that people could talk to, uh, is because he wanted to get that story out there and kind of like let you know that there are different paths that you can take. Um, and that was like one of the most helpful conversations that I had because it just really uh, reassured me that things were going to be okay and that the path that I had was like taking was all right. And also, just like everyone else, people are the most important part. And for me, it was getting all these different externships and then following up with everyone. <coughs> like, you need to stay in touch. Don't just do your externship and then never speak to them again. Like, <coughs> I got my two jobs that I've already had from externing there during law school. And um, people want to hire someone that they already know. I think it's as simple as that. It's much easier to hire someone that's already worked there before, so. So we talked a bit about kind of things here at law school, both academically and um, uh, non-academically, other actions you could take. Maybe we can pivot a little here and talk a little bit about your first year practicing. Uh, and maybe kind of go through in a little more detail what it is you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. Who do you interact with? Do you interact with other lawyers? Do you interact with business people? Um, uh, and then the second part of that question, I guess, would be in what you're doing in your first year, you know, are there things there that you just didn't have any expectation of being doing? Like a, a wow, I had no idea this was a part of this kind of practice, and do you like it, do you not like it? But just giving folks, all of you are in very, very different practice areas with very, very different kinds of companies. Um, so I'd love to be able to give them a little insight into what it means, particularly as a first-year lawyer at these. So often folks that come to speak to are partners at law firms or, you know, senior executives and other things. But I think it'd be great for them to hear, here's what I'm doing. I'm one year out of law school, and, and this is what I'm working with, and this is what my day entails. Hours, all sorts of things, just to get a handle on different areas that you may be interested in. Um, so... Uh Global Road is, is comprised of Open Road Films <coughs> Distribution, and uh, I Am Global, which does foreign sales and um, international distribution. So the idea was, uh, until it crashed and burned into the ground, 
um, was to have to have a full fledged studio, so from beginning to end. So that's what we that's what we worked on, um, and uh, and so I got exposure to every part uh, of the movie industry from the the time that we acquire. Um, Literary material, whether it's a, a screenplay um, or it's an option purchase of like a, a book that's already existing, um, all the way to where we're you know distributing it and so on. So a lot of the work that uh, that I did as a first year uh, was sort of bifurcated. So on the one hand, we did um, what would be classically considered entertainment law work, um, which is doing uh, drafting and negotiating. Uh, writer deals, option purchase, literary material deals, where we acquired literary material um, and would package it with directors and producers and actors and then do deals for all of those elements as well and then send those deals along to production so that they can make, go ahead and make a movie. Uh, we also did a lot of work with finance um, and so uh, and, uh, there, there would be a lot of lending agreements and uh, in the in independent film world especially there's uh, a lot of uh, finance work. Uh, and so I had no real exposure to finance, actual like uh, loan documents and all the, you know, the uh, attendant, you know, the collateral documents that go along with that, the security documents. Um, and so that was a, a, a steep learning curve, but it was actually really rewarding because now I feel like I have a much better handle on how films uh, are financed. Um, and, uh, and, and also international distribution. So there's with, um, with every film, there's like an insane amount of legal delivery um, that comes with it. Um, everything from cast and crew agreements to music licenses um, and, uh, and everything in between. So there's, there's a ton of, of documents to, to put together. There's credit schedules to put together. Uh, I learned that, you know, next to money, uh, the credit is the second most important uh, aspect um, in, the, in the entertainment industry, and that's not just true of actors and so on, that's also true of like, you know, uh, banks. Banks have a credit provision in their loan documents, they want the credit. They the, still get that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and the, the attorney for the bank, the accountant for the attorney for the bank, and then the massage therapist for the accountant for the attorney for the bank, <laughs> all want a credit, and they'll like bring in like lawyers to like, like, Pursue their rights if, like, the, if like a draft credit statement doesn't have fucking massage therapist, or you know, like, and it could be like way down. Nobody pays attention. Nobody watches these credits, but they consider it like really important. Anyway, I have another ten minutes uh, more on this, but <laughs> but I'll, I'll wait for Q. &A. Yeah, so I work at a production company, so I work 
Uh, directly under, it's a, it's a small production company, and the business affairs team is just me and the VP of business affairs. Uh, so I do whatever she wants me to do, uh, which is uh, some drafting. I've gotten to do a little bit of um, the actual negotiation in the last couple months, um, dealing with guilds. Uh, I deal with the guilds a lot because no one wants to deal with the guilds. So anytime <laughs> I have a question about that, that's, I'm usually calling them. Uh, right now, the biggest thing I'm doing is uh, working on legal delivery of um, one of our projects, and so I'm just constantly contacting the um, production coordinator and like their production accountants uh, to make sure that we have all the documents we need, which we don't, so then contacting all of the talent that need to sign a writer to their original deal memo because production didn't realize that it didn't have everything we needed. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I feel like if there's two of you, she should be the president of business affairs, and you should be the VP of business affairs, no? You would think. <laughs> So in terms of scope, I'm on the absolute opposite end of the spectrum from Joe. Uh, I work at a giant global mega firm that is in, I think, 30 countries or something like that. I don't know. We're enormous. Um, my office is pretty small. Our office is maybe 40 people. And then of that 40, about 25 are in the transactional entertainment space, ESM. So, who I interact with on a day-to-day -day basis typically are those 25 people. Um, the way that is structured a big firm is you have a very vertical workflow usually, which means if you're not working with anyone else your year, unless it's like some massive diligence project. You, anyone know what diligence is? Yeah? Okay, cool. One person now. Anyway, diligence, <laughs> diligence often involves reading like literally every agreement you can possibly get your hands on to try to figure out maybe what the value of a company is, whether or not they have a claim to own. There's a million different reasons why you might be doing it. In, in our case, the only time I worked with other uh, first-year associates is when the Weinstein Company declared bankruptcy. We did not represent the Weinstein Company, but we did represent one of the many people that were interested in bidding on the assets, which means that you have to go through every single thing TOEC had to see whether or not you want to buy it. There's a lot of stuff out there, by the way, that has blown up in the last year that was in there. Like the show Yellowstone, which is doing really, really well, that was one of theirs. Steel Team 6, which is just 6 now, which is a History Channel show that did well, and then, um, what's the movie with the bear? Paddington 2. That was a big one. <laughs> anyway, so you're just like, you're reading these endless amounts of agreements and trying to summarize them, basically. So sometimes you get locked into those projects. Other times, I'll just be working with a mid-level associate, turning drafts of contracts. The funny thing is, I work with contracts all day long now. I hated contracts until I hated it. I didn't understand, I mean, I, yeah, I didn't understand. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't fully understand why we were reviewing case law for contracts. I still stand by this, by the way. Like, if you're going to learn contract law, at some point you think you'd look at an actual contract, <laughs> as opposed to, like, a single line in there. Um, fortunately, I got the chance to review plenty, notably, in your guys' classes, which I appreciate, um, and, and in my externship. But then, so I, I do that a lot. So I'm constantly revising drafts, and then I kick it up to the mid-level associate, who will then possibly give me comments, and then we'll kick it up to the partner, and then get them comments, and then, maybe if it's a good day, I'll send it over to the client. Today was a good day. So I got to send something over to like, you know, people who are high up in the sports <coughs> department Facebook being which is essentially a two-line email, please find attached, you know, a clean revised draft of the da 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 agreement plus red lines, da da da. And that's pretty much it. But um, that's that's kind of the way of big law, especially in your first years, you know, they say that your your first clients are your supervisors. And they really, really mean that. That your job is to make your supervisor's life easier, which usually are going to be um, you know, a fourth or fifth year associate uh, when you first start. So as far as hours are concerned, at the end of the day, uh, you know, yet, yesterday, I'm losing track of the days. Yesterday I was in at, I was on a call in the office eight in the morning and I basically worked nonstop except for the 30 minutes I drove home till 9 p.m. The day before, because I was sick, as you may be able to hear, I'm still kind of fighting something, I didn't go into the office at all, didn't tell anyone, it was fine. I worked for like an hour and a half from home and was basically able to check out because I didn't have any deadlines and there's no FaceTime requirement for us. That being said, if I can tell you one thing that is fundamentally true about Big Law that you should be emotionally prepared for is that you will live your life in six minute increments. And what I mean by that is you are dealing with the billable hour and the billable hour is now deconstructed into tenths, which is to say six minutes, which means that you are constantly, constantly clicking timers on and off when you're working and logging your time so that it gets filled out. And at the end of the year, you're expected to fill a number of hours in order to hit your bonus level, which you may or may not care about the bonus, but you probably care about the company goodwill that goes alongside with hitting that amount. 
So that is something you have to be emotionally prepared to do. And it's certainly not the best part of the job. I don't think anyone would say that it is. Um, so that, that's a part of my day-to-day -day job, too. And then you have to like, fill out your time entries and you scramble like, at the end of the week. What did I do on Tuesday for like 18 minutes? I can't remember. And sometimes you just let it go. And then you're like, that was stupid. Anyway, that's my day. <laughs> Just jumping on that real quick, <coughs> do your best to not go to sleep without doing your hours. Because even like a day later, you're like, I work 1.2 hours. Don't remember even touching that. So this is going to be an interesting comment on what I did. Uh, but basically, I'm kind of right in the middle of everyone here, the, the Goldilocks of the panel, if you will. <laughs> I don't think that's even a very good analogy. Kind of came up with that. Shouldn't have said it. So my my firm is single office, about a hundred attorneys. Of those hundred, you should probably know this, six, seven of us are entertainment transactional. Variety of the variety of like practice areas. A music guy. Uh, a few that represent strictly talent, like will not touch production company. Uh, a few that do both, and then a few that only represent production companies will never represent talent, just on principle, no matter what. <laughs> and uh, because we're lean, I work with all of them on literally everything you can imagine, which is great 90% of the time, because you get to be on the production company side, you get to be on the talent side, music, both sides of the music. You get to do just about everything, finance side, uh, but it's also can be very difficult to keep track of what you're doing, especially when someone comes in your office and just says, uh, like, do you remember the condition, the conditions precedent for the global road deal? And I was like, I, in music right now, you got to give me like 30 solid minutes to think about that question, like to flip my brain. But beyond that, it's usually, usually pretty good. You get to work on everything. Uh, we also, I deal with clients personally a lot, which I was not prepared for, and I'm still not prepared for, and I, when a non-interoffice or in-office number calls, I still like ten subs, I go, oh, God, who is this? Because they refuse to put the names on my phone, so I'm just flying, flying blind <coughs> every single day. Uh, so it's, it's great experience, it can be overwhelming at times. Uh, as far as hours go, we're because we're mid-sized, we're pretty. They're pretty good about letting us go home. Like I rarely, I think only worked past nine once, and like I do have to work occasionally on weekends, but never have to go in. I actually went into the office for the first time like, a month ago. And for those of you I interviewed at OCI, or not OCI, but like during callbacks, you know this story. I came in like a Saturday at eleven, which. Like a lot of people in Big Law, that's kind of a common time to be in the office. Like I couldn't even see because the lights weren't on. Like no one was there. None of the elevators worked. I'd like get access, like good security to get access. Like no one shows up. So hours wise, it's pretty good. Uh, yeah, like, I don't know, nine to seven every day, nine to nine to eight, not too bad. Occasionally night stuff, I'll y'all get an email and I will to handle it. But for the most part, hours are pretty good. Not as bad as an agency. So Jill, Alex, and Pat, you, you all are what they call in-house. What are your kind of hours, uh, just so we have a compare or contrast? I know yours will be different soon, but. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, I, I put in 60, and I had to fight um, some of, like, the people in my office about putting in, in other words, they told me to, like, go home. And, and I was the one that tried to, you know, say, like, no, there's work to be done. Um, so it was kind of like a reverse of, like, telling my bosses, like, N no, like, I need to finish these. Anyways, I'm starting to get a sense of why we failed so badly, but anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, 60, 60 hours a week if I, if I had my druthers, and... For the last month, I've been so checked out, like maybe like 45-ish. OK. That's a unique situation, though. Alexander? Um, so most of the attorneys show up between 9 and 10. Everyone else in the company comes in way earlier, and then they leave by like 5 o'clock. Um, but attorneys show up 9 to 10, and usually don't stay past like 7.30. 
It's pretty good, but I mean, obviously, if something comes in, if you get an email and you need to respond, you're expected to do that. You just don't have to stay at work to be able to do that. But um, it's pretty good work-life balance, I would say, being in-house. Um, but you're <coughs> always expected to be on top of things. Um, yeah, in general, my hours are like roughly 10 to 7. The, um, most people at my company get in around 10. I try to get in at like 9.30ish, um, just so I can wrap my brain around whatever I need to do that day. Uh, and then sometimes I have to stay a few hours um, after 7, just if there's like something happening that day, it just really depends. But it's not like a constant thing. I should clarify, it's not a constant for me either. I, really at all, honestly, I've had painfully slow weeks. Those are actually worse because like, you're falling further behind pace and you're like sitting there being like, please work gods, just provide something for me to do. Uh, that was way, way, way worse. And oftentimes at big law firms, January and February are brutal in that regard in not getting work because these are very long-term projects. The thing that I spent my entire day on today, I got put on in March and it's still going. And so, you know, no one's going to all of a sudden, in the 11th hour, parachute in a first year and be like, oh, by the way, client, we also are adding this first year to your bill, who will be working, doesn't know how to do anything, but they're going to sit here and bill up a whole bunch in the meantime. So you have to kind of wait until something starts up again. And so January and February are brutal uh, in the big ball world for entertainment first years. I'll also add that studios like, tend to check out like 3 p.m., especially on Fridays during the summer, so like you can have a slower time during like the summer months because even though there's something to be done, you like call up whoever you're negotiating against and they're just not there. And it's like, oh, that's 2.15 on Friday, I should have known. But. The Friday is the summer we close at 3. Yeah. Yeah, we close so, that too. I, I worked at the wrong company, so I never worked at a company well, that closed at 2 or 3. Well, wait, I have a cool Friday story on that main action. So the first Friday of summer or whatever is like the one before Memorial Day, right? Like everyone's about to go on vacation, relax, and <laughs> For whatever reason, I foolishly decide to answer a phone call at 4 p.m. from this partner that I really like working with, this great guy. And he was like, hey, do you speak French? And I was like, yes. <laughs> yes, I do. I probably should have lied at that point, but it's on the website, so I'm not sure I could have gotten away with it. And he was like, cool. Uh, so Paris is asleep, the Paris office, and they don't really work on weekends anyway because they're French. So any chance you could translate this agreement for me and give me a summary, like, the night before you go to bed? And so you would think this is this awful brutal story, right? I mean, sure, that's kind of rough, but this is also kind of a story of why I like my job a lot. Because as I'm reviewing this agreement, I'm realizing what it is. And what it is is a location agreement for a music video to be shot at the Louvre. Which is to say that I worked on the location agreement for Beyonce and Jay-Z's music video at the Louvre three weeks before it came out, like making sure they had everything. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and, and so, the, you know, yeah. It stinks sometimes to have to like be like, oh, there goes my early Memorial Day. On the other hand, like, you know, once I was able to tell people I did it, it was really rough not telling people for those three weeks. I was so happy when it dropped. I was like, I did that. I did that. I did. All I did was translate. But I did that. Um, you know, ups and downs for sure. So I have several other questions, but um, we have about 15 more minutes here, and. Uh, as you can see, uh, very easy to chat with panels. So I would like to open it up for questions if everybody's okay, and then if we don't have a lot, then I have a bunch more questions for you myself. But I'd rather let all of you ask the questions. So, yes, sir. So, how do things break down in terms of. Oh. No, 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 Mikey, come. Uh, oh, wait, let's... there's somebody behind me right there? No, that's okay. okay. <laughs> Uh, right. How did things break down in terms of like uh, in-house versus working at a firm? What kind of tasks are involved? What kind of work it is? Um, what are the? I guess at what point do uh, clients go to a firm instead of relying on their own lawyers? Litigation. <laughs> um, so like um, we, we do uh, so. Our studio model had a business and legal affairs department that did pretty much everything around drafting and negotiation and uh, legal delivery, um, even on just sales titles where, where we would literally have no other you know, contact or responsibility with the company other than selling it around the world, we would still be responsible for putting together all the paperwork 
um, to deliver to the distributors. Uh, and, uh, and if it ever came to like litigation or whatever, then we would go to, um, in fact, uh, Sam's firm is, is one of the firms that, um, according to our bankruptcy filing, we owe half a million dollars to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to need that before we leave. <laughs> you ain't getting it. Um, so basically, litigation. Okay. Yeah, I'd agree. Like, we have our litigation team in-house, but if something is going to trial, we have outside litigation counsel. Um, so we don't actually handle that ourselves. For us, we have, um, I mean, litigation can have it would be someone else. And then we also have, um, out, like, an outside counsel uh, assigned specifically to, we've filmed two movies at this point, and they each have an outside counsel that we've been um, talking to that person is, like, focused on. They'll use their form agreements for things. Um, but going forward, it, it looks like, since my company is new, we're also kind of figuring things out as we go along. Um, and it looks like going forward, we might try to lean less on production council, but we still might have someone um, just with like a smaller scope on its own to be focused on things that like performs we don't have and stuff like that. Yeah, I would say that there are three models. There's like the companies that do basically everything in-house. They have their in-house team. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there are people with no in-house legal whatsoever. And they sort of outsource all their work to firms like ours. And then there's the hybrid one, which I kind of keep coming back to what I've worked on today, but this Facebook thing does work. Like, um, I deal with some, some people who are business and legal over there. They have a legal team. In fact, this, the legal affairs person I was dealing with today started her career at Latham and spent six years there and then ended up at Facebook. So you'll have like, people kind of working together in that regard, so it just sort of depends. You know, I mean, we, we end up doing a lot of like, big, like corporate, like M and A work or whatever, because you know, in-house counsel isn't usually going to do a giant merger or anything like that. So that'll usually get outsourced to the big law world. But you know, otherwise, it's a mess. Yeah, I tend, I completely agree with that. Um, one thing that those hybrids really like to outsource for that isn't litigation is financing work. Whether if that's usually what they will outsource. And then the, there's obviously smaller production companies that just don't carry any lawyers. Like a lawyer, like one, who really just gets there to issue spot us and make sure we're, you know, doing what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and then the one other rare situation where it feels like you're doing work for a production company that definitely <coughs> it's a lot of work and you feel like they should have their own attorneys in house is when there's like a big like star talent that blows up and creates their own production company, but because they worked with us or with their firm, their attorney for so long, they just keep outsourcing it. So one of our clients is uh, Jim Cameron, or James Cameron, and he has a production company that does like a, a lot of stuff. You'd be surprised that they, they definitely should have an in-house team and definitely save them a ton of money, but he likes one of the attorneys at our office so much that he just sends it out to us, and that's like how I did it. Uh, first off, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and on that topic of time, you mentioned hours working, and kind of like a stylistically is going with the big law firms, like Sam mentioned that he works for Latham, and then the in-house, maybe there's more hours, but a little more comfortable. Was that something that you knew going in you were going to be comfortable with having like potentially a lot of hours working, or is that something you got experience with in your internship or externships that said, hey, maybe I ideologically fit better with this you know, workspace, that's when you find out or just go in there hoping for the best and you find out afterwards once you get your first big gig out of uh, law school. Yeah, I don't know if I do ideologically fit better with this model. Um, that's still TBD for me. I know that I can survive in it uh, and, and do okay, but I think that it's hard to know how you'll react in that environment until you're in it. I was not somebody who, you know, worked from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. in law school at all. That was not the way that, in fact, I worked, as in worked, worked during law school. Like, they, the Bar Association says you're not allowed to work more than 10 hours a week or something like that. I was teaching classes at night, routinely spending 15, 20 hours a week running through that whole thing, which meant I wasn't doing my reading. For certain classes, not your guys' classes. <laughs> I did my reading for your guys' classes. Perfect your security interests all, at all times. <laughs> there you go. Um, but, uh, I don't know. I, and, 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 and frankly, I, I think anyone who says like, yep, I made for it, wait till you get in there, you know? I will say that I did teach for America straight out of undergrad, and I was working 78 hours a week doing that, except way, way less emotionally traumatizing than being a lawyer. Um, that's a joke, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> like, that that kind of set me up to, do that, to know that I could grind if I needed to. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think with all this stuff, I think 
I don't want to speak for the other panelists, but I get the sense, and I certainly felt this way when I was a law student here, that all of us were just trying to do the best we could to get like whatever seemed like a real entertainment job and whatever space that would create the most opportunity for us going forward. And none of us were like, this is where I'm going to go and live for 25 years. And maybe that's our generation, you know. So I, I didn't, that wasn't one of the things that factored in for me you know, um, when, I, when I went into it. You also have to like weigh the hours against what you're actually doing. Like if you were still stuck doing litigation at your law firm, then you would probably mind the hours a lot more than what you do. And I, I knew that I wanted to do something in-house that was not real. I studied film in undergrad and decided like kind of last minute to uh, go to law school. And so I was always interested in working with creatives and working with um, like the people in-house and not being surrounded by lawyers all the time. You also have to know that working in-house, you're never going to be able to make as much money as you do working at a firm. There's a cap, um, but like you have to be okay with that. I think the shorter hours make up for that. So you have to want that balance, but be able to not need to make that much money. I don't know. No one needs to make that much money. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just a different lifestyle. Um, would you have only chosen to go in-house because, say, from a personality fit, that would have been better, or would you have been said, I don't know, I could do large law as well, I think, you know, what your hours? I feel like I made a mistake. Um, I, had, I had two offers to choose from. One was a small entertainment law firm, the other one was in-house. And my thinking was, I know that starting at a firm is preferable because it gives you more opportunities later on than starting at in-house. I've been told that since I started law school. I believed it. I knew it to be true. And yet I still chose the in-house because I figured, well, look, you know, I want to eventually be in-house, so why not start where people are always ending their careers and I'll start my career there. But what I found is that as I've been looking for a second job, Everybody's like, well, where's your law firm experience, you know, and it becomes like much, much more difficult. So when you start off with a law firm, you can either go to a bigger law firm, lateral to another similar size law firm, start your own thing, or you can go in-house. If you start in-house, you're basically stuck in-house, more or less. Um, there's exceptions, but it's just ten times harder, and so I feel that like as much as I've enjoyed, you know, my time, uh, and Global Road is a great working environment. I learned so much about, you know, the, from soup to nuts, everything about the movie industry. Um, nevertheless, <coughs> it would have been just a much, much easier path if I had just started uh, at a law firm. And just jumping back on uh, Jill's point, the kind of idea that if you like what you do, you don't mind the hours, and I still stand by my hours are not bad at all, but um, <coughs> like, you hear that a lot, like in law school, you hear like you see these like older partners at these mega firms come in and say like, like, you know, I love what I do and I don't care, you know, even if it's a hundred and twenty hour week and uh, sitting in your seats, I was always like, bullshit, like hey, you mind that, let's like, to some extent, but it like it kind of is true, like I really do enjoy what I do and I like the time I get a Saturday morning, you know, I'm like I'm usually excited about it because it seems like something would be fun to do. You know, talk to me, made me fun back here for the five year thing, all the different story, but <laughs> two months in, I still like don't mind them at all. So it is, there is some truth to that. Yes, You've all spoken about the difficulties of getting an entry level transactional job, but I'm wondering if you could speak to the experience of your peers who pursued a litigation route. Everyone looked at me, so <laughs> <laughs> what's your question? <laughs> specifically doing entertainment litigation, is it, is it comparable level of difficulty in securing these types of jobs? No, ge generally not. I, I mean, from what I, feel free to disagree, but it seems like litigation is generally easier to get into. Like, I, I was actually thrown into it, and I didn't want to be thrown into it, so. Uh, and it, it is, I, I just don't like litigating. I'm not a litigator, but it, there is a lot of entertainment involved. You review these exact same contracts. So if you're interested in entertainment generally, uh, entertainment venue like litigation, it is a great gig. 
I, you and I could appreciate that like while I was doing it, they're like, hey, my day doesn't really suck that bad, but it kind of sucked. Uh, I'm sure you'll be fine. <laughs> 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 but, but yeah, it's generally easier to get in. Um, you'll find, at least in my firm, intense copyright related issues. They tend to not throw first years in just because it's so, tends to be more complex than other litigation. So you kind of have to work your way in. Sometime, sometimes it just means getting exposure to entertainment generally, even though it's not necessarily a copyright kind of issue. Like uh, we represent OWN in, or the Oprah Winfrey Network in their uh, like labor, in the labor and employment context. So I would jump on those assignments. And nothing to do with like entertainment. It was like, you didn't pay your supervisor. You should probably pay your supervisor, something like that. So, but it was like within OWN, or it was working with OWN, and you got to know the in-house attorneys at OWN, and then suddenly you're on the copyright side of things earlier than you probably would have otherwise been. So it's definitely possible, but just don't expect to get, you know, the, the blurred lines case in your first day. It's gonna take a year probably. <laughs> and then you get it. Then you get uh, it. I guess I'll speak one year for the big law perspective on it. I, I think it's, Probably much easier with the small and the boutique size and the mid size firms that do entertainment because if they do it and they're litigators, then they'll end up doing a decent amount of it, especially in this town. There's a lot of entertainment and litigation around. And by the way, what entertainment litigation even means is a whole other question because a lot of times you end up, I mean, it's like breach of contract, you know, stuff, typically or whatever. I will, I will say the big law side is tricky because pretty much every single law firm in LA, big law firm, does some level of entertainment or at least they say that they do, and what percentage it is of their book makes it hard for you to know whether or not that's actually what you'll be doing when you get there. So a good piece of advice if you're researching firms to try to figure out how, how much of it actually falls into that. You, I mean, I don't remember where I found these numbers, but I was able to find like what percentage of like the partners like ID themselves as working in this field. And if it's like 95% of the partners say that they do entertainment as one of their industries, like that probably means there's a decent amount of entertainment work. And if there's less, then there's probably less. And so it's just, Something for you to keep in as you go through that. I'll chime in one thing just to add to it. As you heard every one of them say, when uh, the gentleman asked, you know, uh, what work's done in house and what do you farm out to the outside, in all the cases they said litigation. So in general, there's a massive amount of, and, and as they all, as, as both Jill and, and Alexandra were saying, as well as Tal, they were doing the transactional work at their company. So if they're doing it at their company, they then don't necessarily need the guys at the end to be doing it at their law firm. So a lot more transactions done in-house, and there's actually been a bit of a paradigm shift since the day when I was working at O'Melveny. Um, a lot of that work now is in-house because it's cost-effective. What still has not shifted in a lot, for example, when I was at Paramount Pictures 10 years ago, they had, didn't have a litigator in-house. Everything was farmed out, and it's still by and large is. So there is a lot of litigation around town that is handled at the outside <coughs> law firm, which is why some of these firms, to the extent they have summer programs, like a firm like Greenberg Trout, will say, you can come in our summer and be a litigation, because they actually, a lot more of that is done by the firms. The other is somewhat the dynamic of litigation. Generally speaking, unless you're doing the big deals that Sam's talking about, um, most entertainment is fairly vertical. Uh, you don't need a bunch of juniors. He said, I barely ever work in the transactional space with other first years. The bigger firms that do bigger litigation can have five first years working on litigation. So it tends to be an area that can also absorb a lot of young lawyers, uh, even if you're not going to see the intricate pieces of it. So no, I would make the argument uh, litigation entertainment related litigation with a lot of firms around town and some of them specifically say that's what they have their summer programs focus on for OCI. Yes. Um, so do you have to remember when you were like applying to law school or you were a 1L, how have those expectations morphed out of your industry? Like I feel like a lot of people uh, talk to or you know have wanted to be an entertainment lawyer but then in the industry when they were applying as a 1L, it's kind of off these fantasy or just kind of how it feels like when you watch Entourage, it means it's going to be like that or something. And I just want to know, like, how has, like, how, how has, how, not really what is it like now, or how, how have those expectations shifted, like, 
Can I steal that question for next year? That's a really good one. <laughs> which, which character do you think they want to be in Mothra? <laughs> I always wonder about that. How many percent are like Ari or do people Ari? want to be Ari? They realize Ari's kind of a villain, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Ari didn't make it out of 2017. 2018, let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll give you my quick answer, which is that I came in at the first second day I was in Moscow, I had a friend who I uh, was a three all the time, and I remember sitting down with him and being like, yeah, I'm never going to do good ball. I'm not even going to do OCI. So uh, that changed pretty significantly. I, I think I didn't know, I had no idea where the jobs were. didn't know what was available, who I could work with or for, or how to do it. So all of that was just me. Um, and, and honestly, what I did is go to things like this, and figure it out, and talk to people. Like, like that old adage, the talk just repeated that, you know, you should start in a firm and not in house. I must have heard that a million times when I was considering jobs. Like, like I really, so, but I, you know, I heard it from places like this. It wasn't from a professor in class or anything. It might have been actually, again, it's a very entertainment heavy course alone, but for most people, they won't get that in class. Certainly not for everyone else. Um, I mean, it's, it's cool. I thought it would be cool and it is cool. There are things that about it that suck. Like, if there's any job where there's like things about it that will suck. And you have to kind of weigh the percentages. Like, if I'm happy most of the time, then maybe you need to do it. But I feel like the environment is kind of what I expected. Like I said, I really enjoyed being around the creatives and being around all the different people at the production company. That's what I wanted. And that's where I am now. And I, that, I mean, overall, I like it. Yeah, that's too simple of an answer. But yeah, I knew I wanted to do entertainment. And I thought, I thought that you couldn't even start in-house. I was kind of told, you're not going to get that job until you're five years out. And I mean, technically, I started at a firm and then made the switch. But um, I just didn't realize that there are lower-level attorney positions in-house. And if, at least at my company, there's room to grow. So people stay there their entire careers. People have been there like 20 years. Um, and they started at the associate director level like me and then moved all the way up. So it does exist if that's the path that you want. Um, but I do stand by going to a firm first gives you more options. Um, but I think there are different paths you can take. Yeah, on that note, actually, uh, something I forgot to say is in my interview <coughs> with, um, for the job that I have now, um, the woman who hired me uh, said that she initially was looking for someone to be more of a um, assistant, and she was like, and she did a whole round of interviews with that in mind, and then she realized that she needed someone who could do some of the more substantive legal stuff that she could train. And when she brought me on, she said that she was um, looking for a business affairs coordinator to do a mix of legal and administrative for uh, a year or two, get experience, and after. Um, that period of time, uh, I would either be able to move up, and if for some reason I couldn't move up with the company, that she would help me find another position somewhere else. So that's Great. Any other questions? I thought, yes. I have a question about the OCI process and kind of like big law in general. Um, when you're doing the OCI process, were you like just looking for a big law job or something entertainment related? And also at your law firm now, is there a possibility you might be switched out of the entertainment field, like where you might be needed somewhere else, or how does that work at a big law firm? Uh, well, I'll take this because we're at least first. Uh, I do. I want to do entertainment. I did my. I did all my bidding based on that, but I also was realistic in that it is difficult to get a transactional entertainment job at a firm. So I, like I said, came in ready to just kind of get a resume name on there and then jump to in-house as soon as possible. Um, that, uh, as far as your second question, I, I know I won't be transitioned out of entertainment transactional because we're like only 100 people, we're all in the same, uh, 100 attorneys all in the same office, so there was some hurt feelings when I moved departments the first time, so I, I feel pretty safe that they're not going to do that again. It's still slightly awkward around certain floors for me, so like, literally, like I avoid a certain floor on like, the elevator instead of the stairs. <laughs> I'm probably making it worse by like avoiding it, but it's just how many floors is your office? Three. I don't go to that middle floor. I was, like, I was like, I don't remember it being that big. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's the middle floor. That's the floor. Yeah. Is there like a staircase going down yep. at some point too? Yep. Oh man. I mean, 
20 to 22. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone in the other building hates me because they, like, I get on to go for like, two floors. And, but, so I, I feel secure that I won't be moving again. But, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I could theoretically, I'm not officially in the group. No one officially joins the group that I'm in until about two years in, so there's nothing guaranteed. That being said, I'm just hired through this process by the people in the group, and it's the majority of the work that I've done. I have done some general corporate work, although even then it's for companies that typically play in the entertainment space, sort of, so it's tangentially related. Um, as far as OCI is concerned, I was in the same boat. I knew I wanted entertainment all along. That being said, I also wanted a job, so I just sort of stacked everything uh, and did a million interviews and, and worked my way through that process. And um, I definitely put my foot in my mouth a couple times by stating that I wanted to do entertainment. I, uh, like, I remember one day, I have a friend who's a partner over at Manat who works in their music ball practice, and I was like, oh, I got a dream job. I'd love to do that, work with him. And so I sat down my interview, and I mentioned that I wanted to work in that group. And this is actually different from the story I told earlier, which is about a different room. Uh, and I found out that, that I was dead in the water the second I said that. They went back and told me, he's like, that's it. We don't, you know, we don't hire that group. We like to take people who have been there for a few years. So your mileage will vary, and you have to decide how committed you are to starting straight out in entertainment. You know? If you have to do it, if that's what you want to do, then you will find yourself with a smaller number of options. Um, but at the plus side, if I hadn't been committed, I never would have got my job. Somebody walks into my office, the, this like very niche entertainment practice in Century City, and says, I think I kind of like entertainment, but I kind of might just want to do some other stuff. They're like, that's cool. Why are you here? Go downtown. You know, We have an office down there. That's exactly what you want. And you'll, there's no way I mean, that you'll get a call back. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta kind of be true to yourself, I think, in the end, and figure out what fits your narrative the best. I will say that if you are interested in following my proposal, <coughs> the route I was going to take, where you just get a, like a, a resume name and then jump in the house, don't lead with entertainment only for most firms. That, this would be an exa uh, the exception. We'll but the rule generally is be open, because that's what you're probably gonna have to do. I know my firm, if you, a few people came in this year and said like, for entertainment only, that's it, and it's it, it's hard. It's a hard sell to the hiring partners because they don't put anyone, they don't put any first years in, and then they don't even assign departments so you're ready to start. That's like not that the hard way. Save as best is listed amongst other interests. Exactly. Any others, or should we break and you guys can kind of uh, network for a while? I hope everybody will stick around, <coughs> chat with this team, uh, chat amongst yourself. Uh, we'll be out there. And I know some other colleagues who couldn't come because they have music law will be joining. Uh, and we know a few that would like to speak to you guys directly. So um, thank you, everyone. Thank you.